So good morning, everybody. And thank you to so many members and guests who have joined us from all over Canada and a good number who are giving up their Friday nights in China to join us. Uh, I think we have about 180 people signed up to join us today, which is great. Uh, I will present the survey results. I'm Sarah Kudalakos, Executive Director of CCBC. And then I'll moderate a discussion with Dr. Walid Hejazi and Dr. Chung Li, after which we will take questions from the audience via the Q&A function. Uh, we have disabled the chat function, so you can send everything through the Q&A. The presentation is being recorded, and the PDF of today's presentation will be put on the ccbc.com event page, uh, along with the report, which can be found on ccbc.com in English, French, and Chinese. And, uh, all right, let me just make sure we're set here. Okay. So, what I'm going to do is take you back to late 2018, and let's kind of look at a timeline here. So, at the end of in November 2018, bilateral air travel was booming. We had more than 700,000 tourists from China coming to Canada. We had lots of business travel. So the four trips to China I typically make paled in comparison with my members, many of whom were going six to 10 or more times each year. The economic and financial strategic dialogue held in November 2018 and the presence of dialogue participants, including State Councillor Wang Yong, with Ministers Morno, Carr and Bryson at our AGM that same day, marked a real high point in relations and everyone thought 2019 would be even better than 2018. At the end of 2018, bilateral merchandise trade had reached a record high of 103, Canadian, 103 billion Canadian dollars and exports were growing again, spurred by an increasing middle class in China that wants products that Canada sells. Then in December 2018, everything changed with detentions in both countries and all that followed. So when we fielded our biannual survey in February last year, nobody was traveling and there was a great deal of uncertainty. Nonetheless, respondents were largely optimistic about Canada-China business, and it appeared that over the long term, business between the two countries was still on an upward trajectory. So we wanted to see how, a year later, companies were feeling and how their actual 2019 business fared. So we fielded this interim survey with a limited number of questions. And I'm just going to double check and make sure that... Uh, we have no technical problems here. Okay. So we knew that not only was the bilateral tension a potential factor, but the US-China trade war had been raging all year. And at the time we fielded the survey, COVID-19 was shutting China down, but it hadn't yet been named a global pandemic. We also knew that some of our members were really going strong. So we hypothesized that China's economic policy could have both positive and negative effects. So I'll go into the results in detail, but first let's look at the key takeaways. Number one, the impact of bilateral tension is not consistent across industries. Some have been very seriously impacted, some enough that they're replacing China for other countries in their diversification strategy. Both the US-China trade war and China's economic developments have helped some companies and hurt others. Now last year, respondents felt that both governments were equally responsible for diffusing the bilateral tensions that had been caused by the detention of citizens of, of the other country. And this year we asked if respondents clearly understood Canada's strategy for China and the majority said no. Furthermore, that lack of a strategy creates uncertainty that prevents business from being accomplished. And finally, COVID-19 adds yet another challenge to businesses. 84% of respondents said, uh, reported a negative impact of COVID-19, and that was before it really hit Canada and the rest of the world. But China's quicker recovery does bring some optimism. So let's look at who we surveyed. We had 282 respondents and 275 identified their sector, which you can see here. Because not all respondents answered every question, you'll see an N on each figure, which shows the number of respondents for that question. In terms of sectors, while the group was slightly services heavy, the 18 sectors represented in the survey include a broad range of cross-border business interests that generally reflect CCBC's member base. But survey respondents did not have to be CCBC members to participate. 61% were members and 39% were not. 
A few years ago, we made our surveys bilateral, and this main survey that we do every two years, which looks at companies' trends related to profitability and business challenges, allows us to identify common challenges among companies doing business in the other country. Now, 90% of CCBC's members are Canadian companies, but many of them are engaged in investment attraction and the services that accompany it. So the experience of Chinese companies in Canada is of interest for a number of reasons. For this survey round, 87% are Canadian companies doing business in or with China, and 13% are Chinese companies doing business in Canada. Most of the Chinese company respondents said that they are based in Canada, so we infer that these Chinese companies are established companies here in Canada with legal Canadian entities. And we do draw some conclusions in this report based on those Chinese respondents, but there is a small number, so it's hard to always generalize. So the big question is, what did last year's bilateral tension do to business results? This question looks only at 2019, so there's no COVID impact in here yet. So in terms of business, 79% said that the situation in 2019 affected their business. And of that 79%, 43% claimed a major impact and 36% minor. In last year's survey, only 21% of companies, only 20% of companies said they had been negatively impacted in the early days of the Canada-China dispute. We heard last year that cancellation or postponement of deals and contracts was a concern when 18% had already experienced this by early March. Deals were a big casualty of the 2019 tension with 51% of respondents saying they had contracts or deals postponed and 40% canceled, which was a big jump from last year. We also looked at demand for products and services. Last year, 20% said demand had decreased and this year it was 46% who saw a decrease in demand. Now, as I mentioned, last year in March, people were very nervous about travel. About half of Canadian respondents and a quarter of Chinese respondents said they were anticipating postponing or canceling travel due to bilateral tensions. This year, 63% of respondents in total said they had canceled or postponed exploratory business development trips or negotiation trips in 2019. And if you think about the makeup of the respondents with many in service sectors, this goes hand in hand with business being down. Now, primarily the bilateral tensions we talk about come from the Meng Wanzhou and Two Michaels issues, but there are other issues that our government deals with in this category. So we asked respondents about two of them, protests in Hong Kong and Xinjiang. Specifically, we asked if people have changed their approach to doing business or pursuing opportunities in Hong Kong as a result of the protests there. And we asked, are you taking measures to ensure your company is not exposed to human rights concerns in Xinjiang via suppliers, partners, or investments? So on Hong Kong, half of the respondents do not conduct business in or with Hong Kong, and 35% said they do not make, did not make changes in their Hong Kong business as a result of the protests. There were only 13% that had, and they reported that they had reduced travel, they had reduced business, and they had adapted their business. And educational services and professional services were the sectors with the most responses among that 13%. On Xinjiang, we know that very few Canadian companies have business there. In the past, we've asked Canadian companies where in China they're doing business, and only 3% have reported Xinjiang as a place where they have major business activities. But with increasing focus on this region, particularly the Australian think tank report that called out international companies whose suppliers may be using labor coming from Xinjiang, forced labor, we wanted to start to track this. So only 11% of 227 respondents said they are taking measures regarding Xinjiang. So more than would have actual business there. Two thirds of that 11% are in financial services, professional services and agri-food. And the most commonly cited actions being taken are compliance measures, avoiding business in the region, avoiding business with entities there or supply chain partners with clients in this area. But again, we see from our member numbers that there isn't as much activity in those two regions. And the big driver of bilateral tensions is definitely the fallout from Hmong and the two Michaels. So let's look more specifically at what people told us the impact on their business was. So looking at the responses to our question in another way, you can see that there were multiple things that were cited for impact on Canada-China business in 2019. And uh, I'd like to point out that some businesses were impacted differently. It wasn't all bad. 9% uh, saw a major increase in demand. 33% in total saw their demand up. Uh, and 
43% uh, signed new contracts. So while the situation is not good for some, it's not all that. So if we look just at the question, how was business in 2019, you can see that it was down more than up, but this varies greatly by sector, you know, you had, and you had 34% stable. So we broke it out by sector to see what was happening. So first, in last year's survey, these six sectors told us they expected to expand, but in reality, business was down in 2019, at least as much as it was up. And in many cases, the ability to travel has an impact. This may be self-imposed. We have members that have said to us, I'm not traveling to China until the situation is resolved. Uh, company policy on travel has an impact. And in some cases, Chinese government policy affects this. Uh, we see educational institutions whose professional training uh, groups coming into Canada have been significantly impacted. There are three sectors that told us last year they expected stable performance and largely performed as planned. Natural resources was primarily stable, as was clean tech. 40% of manufacturing companies had stable performance, but 45% were actually up. Now, only 9% of Chinese respondents said that their business with Canada was down, and 50% said business was stable, with 36% saying it was up over the previous year. So this is positive news for the Canadian economy, demonstrating that international investors are able to operate and grow as local companies. Chinese respondents told us that economic developments in China and the U.S.-China trade war were factors that had a greater impact on their Canada-China business than the political tensions between Canada and China. Uh, and again, we know that these are largely companies that are already doing business in, China, in Canada, and an ongoing operation in Canada is less likely to be impacted by bilateral tensions than a Canadian service or export business to China. Now, Chinese investment in Canada, which you can see on the left, is still significantly down from a decade ago, but it also had a positive year in 2019. Uh, the chart on the left shows that Chinese investment into Canada fell 74% from 2017 to 2018, but rebounded by 56% in 2019. One third of that 2019 total resulted from Chinese companies increasing their stake in existing Canadian investments. Recent Chinese investment has been heavily concentrated in the metal and mineral sector, followed by health, biotechnology, and agri-food sectors. So our takeaway from this slide is that once a company is up and running in Canada, it's a Canadian company, something our economic developers use to promote Canada as an investment destination in countries around the world. Now, if we look at the three factors pre-COVID-19 that we hypothesized were important factors, you can see that each of them had either a major or minor impact on the majority of respondents. Uh, and when you combine those numbers, the political situation impacted 79%, economic developments in China at 70%, and the US-China conflict at 65%. So the bilateral political situation had the most major impact but the other two are not insignificant. So what do we mean by economic developments in China? So China's economic policy from the five-year plan to China 2025 to the Belt and Road Initiative all get very well documented. So it's not hard for companies to understand their place in China's economic trajectory. In addition, China's focus on growing consumption and reducing export-led and infrastructure-led growth has allowed companies to reach a large and growing base of affluent consumers. Sometimes these policies work against companies, but sometimes they open doors. In some cases, the maturation of certain industries means China needs us less. A respondent from the education sector told us that the Chinese are simply developing greater internal capacity to meet their own educational needs. Another in that sector spoke of institutions in China being more self-reliant in terms of educational services, causing a decline in student recruitment from China, a fact they considered minor but important. Others told us that China's posture on the global political environment has changed, and it's as had it, its intention on domestic governance. Um, this respondent said, thought that neither development was favorable to the pursuit of a closer relationship, uh, and that those trends are a reason to pause and reconsider overall engagement with the country. 
Now, last year, we talked a lot about Canada being like the meat in a U.S.-China sandwich, particularly as the Meng Wanzhou extradition request came from the U.S. So similar to China's economic developments, the U.S.-China trade war similarly opened doors for some and closed doors for others. 23% of Canadian respondents said that the U.S.-China trade war led to a decrease in Chinese demand for its goods or services, and 23% said it prompted them to shift their business strategy to alternate markets for goods and services. On the negative side, the U.S.-China trade war raised business costs, uh, it increased supply and materials costs, and interrupted the supply of U.S. goods used in products made by Chinese partners. One respondent told us that the U.S.-China phase one trade deal is less consequential than the various policy prongs of U.S.-China decoupling under the banner of national security. And this decoupling of economies and supply chains has heightened uncertainty, leading to a reluctance by Canadian companies to make dis business decisions. But some told us that the impact of U.S.-China is offset by the even more negative impact of Canada-China relations. Now, on the positive side, in some cases, the U.S.-China trade war has created opportunities for Canadian companies, with one Canadian responded from the agri-food sector saying it led to major growth in their business in China. Another said that the U.S.-China trade war led to the movement of some R&D from the U.S. to Canada, and another commented that the trade war may have helped soften prices as Chinese companies succumbed to trade war pressures. So overall, the U.S.-China trade war ranked third among the three issues, but it is the one with the most moving pieces that companies need to pay attention to, and we'll elaborate on this in our panel. One of our big takeaways from last year was that despite the bilateral tension, companies felt optimistic about growth. This continued in 2019. So for the sample as a whole, 43% are optimistic, and that's up from 31% last year. 28% are neutral, down from 35%, and 21% are, are pessimistic, up from 19%. 15% were don't know or NA last year, and that fell to 8% this year. So what this tells us is that fewer companies are on the fence about their company's prospects in China. The optimism is even stronger among CCBC members, where two-thirds have a positive outlook on their company's future business with China. Now, last year's survey told us that bilateral tension had led 52% of Canadian businesses to undertake slight to significant changes in their business plans. We took these initiatives to be a temporary response to bilateral tension because survey respondents were also optimistic about continued growth and development of their Canada-China business. Two in three Canadian companies said they plan to expand in, their next, in the next five years, and 77% said that China was a top strategic priority. This year, we asked about China's role in that strategy, and 38% uh, had either made it a lower priority or replaced it altogether. Now, industries that are lowering China's place in their strategy are all services, as you can see on this slide. Interestingly, an equal amount of tourism companies made China both lower and higher in their priorities. We found that Canadian companies that did lower the priority are actively seeking market diversification options and respondents looking, are looking to markets like Europe, the US, the Middle East, Korea, Japan, and Thailand. And one respondent reported to be strongly considering a complete pivot away from China into more democratic and higher growth countries and regions such as ASEAN. Other respondents that lowered um, China's position in their strategy told us that China, changes in China are just happening too fast, creating additional risk and challenges for long-term planning. Now, here are some sectors that have either retained or increased China's place in their strategy. Again, we can see that there's a correlation between Canadian companies who are continuing to prioritize China in their global strategy and those that are active in areas that China has emphasized in its economic plans and policies. This reinforces the finding that some sectors are more likely to benefit from China's targeted focus on developing certain sectors of the economy. And Canadian companies should pay close attention to China's economic development and five-year plans for insight into new opportunities. Finally, we asked whether respondents understood the Canadian government's strategy for China. Uh, and 55% of them told us that they did not feel that it had been clearly communicated. Uh, of that 
so of those of those numbers, if we split them out, 38% of Canadian respondents told us it was clearly communicated versus 45 overall, and 58% of Chinese respondents felt that it was clearly communicated. And on this one, we received an overwhelming number of comments. Uh, more than 120 people actually wrote in fairly complex answers to this question. And while there was agreement on the lack of understanding a strategy, there wasn't agreement that Canada should simply appease China. There were a lot of comments expressing concern about the two Michaels, calls for a hard stance on the issues. Uh, one person said future engagement needs to be tightly managed and eyes wide open. But there were lots of comments about the need to be clearer on the importance of the long-term relationship with China and the underlying linkages between our countries. Things like energy and pipelines that have long-term positive implications were not being addressed. Uh, people want something less short-term and less reactive, and we had many comments saying that vague positions on the Hmong and Huawei issues make some business interactions difficult as they cannot predict Canada's next steps. Um, so we also heard that there were some concerns about Chinese partners' perception of Canada as a sovereign nation separate from the U.S., and that kind of takes us back to being that uh, meat in the middle of a sandwich. Uh, so people thought that a clear policy would enable the Canadian government and its agencies to advocate for Canadian business, political, and judicial interests. Finally, we asked about COVID-19. So with almost all surveys completed by March 4th, the results clearly fell into the China is affected, rest of the world is not time frame. And you can see here that 84% saw a negative impact of COVID-19 and 80% at that point thought business would return to normal after the end of 2020. Last week, we polled participants in a webinar with CCBC members, and although the sample size in gray here is much smaller at 43 people, we can see that the impact is now more significant, the timeline has shifted out farther, and main concerns have shifted from travel by employees and customers to reduced demand and logistics being bigger concerns, in addition to those travel concerns. So COVID-19 layers on another layer of travel complexity to an already difficult travel environment. And as we have a very good sized group today, we are going to re-poll you in a few minutes, and we'll be able to compare these results at the end of our session. So in conclusion, this survey revealed that Canada-China business was significantly impacted by tense bilateral relations, the US-China trade war, COVID-19, and China's economic development, including government policy, industrial goals, and consumption. The impact is not consistent across industries or between Canadian and Chinese companies. Despite challenges, some Canadian companies in specific industries fared quite well in 2019. China's economic policy and priorities reveal areas where demand for Canadian products and services, as well as cross-border collaboration and partnership will continue to grow. And there may be opportunities for Canadian companies as China transitions to a post-COVID-19 economy coming out the chute faster than other suffering economies. But 43% of respondents' business fell in 2019, following that record 2018, and the lack of a clear Canadian government strategy remains a barrier for businesses. Um, last year, our conclusion was that businesses in both countries want their governments to sit down and work this out properly. Um, that call was echoed again this year, that the, the responsibility is still on both governments. Um, but they also said that a clearer go government strategy on the Canadian side could help alleviate the impact of these challenges on Canada-China business, while also helping to dispel uncertainty, provide direction, and better position Canada-China business to succeed and grow. A couple of weeks ago, nominations for the Donner Prize were announced. These are books on policy, and they included U of T professor Wendy Dobson's book, Living with China, A Middle Power Finds Its Way. The book explores many of the same issues cited by our survey respondents, and Wendy points a way forward that includes the need for a proactive strategy that encompasses government leadership, a stronger Canada brand, and an emphasis on human capital, security issues, and bilateral trade and investment liberalization. And I should add that in the comments we got on Canadian government strategy, many companies told us that they had started to downplay the Canadian brand in their own business development. And that was following last year when more than 80% told us that the Canada brand played a major or minor role in their business development. So that's an important uh, finding. 
Now, on the business side, CCBC takes away the need to guide and assist organizations whose travel and business development patterns are hampered by travel disruptions that now go well beyond those prompted just by the bilateral tension. What happens if you can't or won't travel? How do you adjust your business processes with a culture where relationship building is so important? Now, I think China has actually surprised itself with how quickly it adapted to remote work arrangements. And I'm sure our business development processes will adjust, but it's gonna to be tough in the meantime. And uh, CCBC will be using our strong team in China to support members who can't rely on face-to-face -face interaction with suppliers or customers. And we can be their avatar, so to speak, in some cases during what will be an extended period without bilateral travel. For example, last week we attracted more than 600 Chinese students to two Canadian university showcases that featured eight of our leading institutions. So this was a great connection to potential students in China. We're also looking at how we can help universities and colleges to develop community among their incoming and returning students in China if they can't be physically on campus in the fall. Our team has lots of creative ideas, whether you need help with suppliers, clients, or putting a representative in our incubation centers in Beijing and Shanghai. We also take away from the results that new activation of companies needs to be very well aligned with China's economic goals, encouraging and supporting companies in sectors that are benefiting from the opportunities. And we will help companies to do deep dives into the next five-year plan, to arm them with data to better understand their market, and to help them to more quickly get their inventory online and in the hands of Chinese consumers. So now we're gonna move to our panel. And as we do this, I'm gonna pull up our COVID-19 poll. So I ask all of you who are connected to Zoom on your device to please answer these three questions while I introduce our panel. And then we will show you those answers and how they compare to the original poll at the beginning, uh, at the end, sorry. So uh, let me introduce our two speakers. Chung Li is director and senior fellow at the Brookings Institution's John L. Thornton China Center. Uh, Chung is also a director of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and a distinguished fellow of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. Dr. Lee's research areas include the transformation of political leaders, generational change, the Chinese middle class, technological development in China, and U.S.-China relations. And he is the author and editor of numerous books on many interesting topics related to China. He's also the guy we call when we need somebody to read the tea leaves on uh, Chinese elite politics. So Chung received an MA in Asian Studies from the University of California at Berkeley and a PhD in Political Science from Princeton University. Our other panelist is Dr. Walid Hajazi, who is Associate Professor of Economic Analysis and Policy and Academic Director at the Rotman School of Management. He has researched and published extensively on topics related to international trade and foreign investment. Walid has advised the Canadian and foreign governments extensively and testified many times before parliamentary and Senate committees on global competitiveness. He is currently working on a series of studies with the Canadian government which shed light on the competitiveness and productivity of Canadian firms. He teaches macroeconomics and global strategy in Rotman's MBA and EMBA programs and he has also delivered lectures in over 30 countries. Walid has traveled extensively to China over the past decade and has worked with several companies and many executives on deploying global strategies, particularly as it relates to the evolution of China into an innovation-based economy. And Walid has overseen the research on our last three surveys, so he is very deep into the data with us and uh, very well aware of our history uh, with these surveys. All right, so Chung Li, who is joining us from Washington, D.C., is going to um, first make an opening statement. Welcome, Chung. Oh, thank you, Sarah. And uh, first, I would like to congratulate Sarah and uh, Lalit for your, uh, and your colleagues uh, at the CCBC for the release of your very timely and informative, uh, informative survey we just heard. More, more generally, I want to applaud you for your long-standing constructive work to promote economic ties and the cultural understanding uh, across the Pacific. Now, your outstanding work is particularly valuable for the business community now, uh, an exceptionally challenging time resulting from four factors. I will uh, just very uh, quickly mention these four factors. 
One is a prolonged trade war between United States and China. Two, the lengthy political and judicial, judicial tensions between Canada and China, as your survey uh, uh, emphasized. But also two other things I think even more important. Uh, uh, the third one is the fast and uh, all-round all deterioration of the Sino-US bilateral relationship. And finally, the enormous impact of the corona uh, pandemic. Now, all three countries uh, that we um, uh, you know, will discuss, China, Canada, and the United States, have been massively devastated by the coronavirus. In the United States, where I live and work, the impacts have been catastrophic. With only 4% of world population, uh, the US has accounted for more than one third of the infected people and the 29% of the death toll globally. Now, um, anxiety, confusion, fear, panic, and the distrust are widely spread. Now, for the global business community, this is also time for rethinking and uh, re-examining re the nature of our integrated world, the future of economic globalization, the new international geopolitical landscape, and the potential new business strategies and priorities. Now, to a great extent, all of these necessary step, uh, next steps have been reflected in the impact survey that Sarah just shared with us. Now, to, uh, uh, so that uh, you particularly uh, in terms of the industrial and the sectorial variation, optimism in certain areas and the pessimism in others, caution and adjust, uh, adjustment at the time of uncertainty, and the need to reprioritize, uh, reprioritize some development strategies. Now, I share the main sentiment of the survey that China is leading the transition to post-pandemic uh, recovery. And there may be increasingly attractive opportunities for Canadian companies there. China's uh, promotion of consumption uh, strengthened by urbanization, the country's growing middle class, its emphasis on innovation, green development, public health, social welfare, and the financial opening all make China even more co competitive in the global uh, economy. Yet, I'm also deeply worried about the dire situation in US-China relations, which has the potential of quickly spiraling out of control as a result of the rise of ultra-nationalism and also zero-sum mindsets in both Washington and Beijing. Now, in that regard, I also want to convey to the business community in Canada the importance of maintaining a global perspective. What you are pursuing now is not simply economic profit. Indeed, your efforts will also serve to promote peace across the Pacific. As Jack Ma said, I quote here, when trade stops, a war will begin. In history, as we know, wars and epidemics often have merged hand in hand uh, as twin brothers, as someone said. This is the awful outcome we should and must work to avoid. Thank you uh, uh, for letting me to give this opening remark. I look forward to exchanging views and also listen, uh, to hearing my colleagues' remarks. Thank you, Chung. Very well said. Walid, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. And before I get to my opening statement, I just want to highlight one thing that Cheng said is a decade ago, the EU won the Nobel Peace Prize to exactly reinforce the point that you make that since the creation of European free trade, there haven't been any major wars within Europe. That's why the big concern about Ukraine. But having said that, that point cannot be underestimated in terms of its importance. Trade is not just economic, but there's a lot of other um, benefits that come from trade in terms of bringing communities together. But I want to step back and think about China in the broader global context and historically, and think about why this survey is so important, especially today. Everyone on this call understands how China has changed over the past 50 years. You know, more than a billion people in Asia have been taken out of poverty as a result of 
engagement in the global economy through international trade and global supply chains. China is now at an important inflection point going from a platform for low cost production to serve the world's manufacturing to a more innovation based economy. So this transition, this inflection point is incredibly important. That's sort of the very first important trend to think about. I'm working currently with a company that interfaces between Western retailers and factories in China and in Asia. And companies are really thinking forward about how do we manage China's changing economic landscape, thinking about moving low cost production out of China because um, of the rising cost of operating in China because of the trade war. But I think what's really important and what doesn't get enough attention is pursuing opportunities within China. What are the strategies we need to deploy in order to make companies more competitive to compete inside the Chinese market? Uh, a few months ago, Chad Brown uh, from the Peterson Institute presented a beautiful diagram which looks at tariffs. And if you go back five years, tariffs between China and the US were three or 8%, depending on which way the, the trade goes. But now tra uh, tariffs are upwards around 25%. They're upwards around 25%. Now what's really important to understand is back in the 1930s, the United States had tariffs of 25 or 30%, but they were with the whole world. Now they're just with China. So developments in China, it's at an inflection point, the US-China trade war, political tensions between Canada and the US, and COVID. Wow, what a difficult environment uh, uh, to navigate. So why is this survey incredibly important? Because it gets down to the individual company level to look to see how all of these forces manifest themselves in corporate strategies, but not only corporate strategies, but also those strategies that yield better outcomes than others. So one point I think must be emphasized, and Sarah said it in her introductory comments, not only is there variability in performance outcomes across sectors, but even within sectors. Within sectors, there's some companies that have been able to navigate all of these challenges very well, and other companies that have not. And so why this survey is so important and why I encourage everyone on this call, including their entire sea level to take the surveys, to look to see how do I benchmark? How does my company or my organization benchmark relative to other organizations within the sector? And why are some companies in the sector able to navigate better than others? That's why this survey is not only very, very timely. I encourage everyone on the call to really read it in depth and benchmark your company and organizations to what you see in the survey. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Walid. Okay, so I've got a number of questions. Um, so let's, let's look at one I wanted to ask both of you. So we see in this report, some companies shifting efforts to other markets for various reasons. Now, again, that was all pre-COVID. The, the, the mix of economic growth opportunities may be completely changed. But if you're selling to China's middle class, there's just so much market potential that it's sometimes hard to imagine replacing China with, say, a Vietnam. Uh, so how can companies leverage the potential, potential of China in the face of so many challenges and a system that stubbornly refuses to look like what we thought it should look like? You want me to speak first? Go ahead. Well, actually, um, China not only is the first major country you know, going out of the, you know, the, the coronavirus impact, of course, that uh, we still need to be uh, very careful about the possible second wave. But the fact that uh, China um, uh, reopened step by step, now even Wuhan, you know, has been uh, reopened. So that actually is a very, very important message. You know, when business community look at the market, you should look at the stability. I mean, even with this kind of enormous um, challenge, uh, China, um, you know, survive and not only survive, but also come out relatively strong. Now, China's market is huge, as you said, and um, uh, about the middle class urbanization and also some of the policies moving towards, as the value said, to the to the consumption and also the uh, the value chain uh, to other aspects of value chain. But on the other hand, uh, China has uh, become less vulnerable 
to supply chain uh, rearrangement. China's uh, processing trade exports account for 19% of the country's GDP about uh, 13 years ago in 2007. Now it is only 5%. So uh, it's, it's a market, it's a, a, to a certain extent that, um, you know, in terms of industrial, in terms of the rearrangement, China is relatively in good shape. Now also according to the McKinsey China report, which was released about a few months ago, uh, they stated China's dependence on the world economy is declining relatively, while the world's dependence on the chi Chinese economy is rising. This is very much in line with your survey report. Now also according to McKinsey report in 2030, China's consumption will likely be as high as about six trillion uh, U.S. dollars, which is a combination of both uh, the United States and uh, Western Europe combined then, and uh, two times than India and uh, um, uh, Southeast Asia, the entire Asian countries combined, ASEAN countries in combined. Now, so this is, uh, again, I'm, sorry, I'm correct, it's the uh, entire ASEAN countries combined along with India two times China's uh, uh, market. So that gives you the perspective. Now, of course, there's some problems uh, in China's market, but um, I mean, look at today's world, uh, which market is really uh, perfect? There's no such a market is perfect. We're all dealing with this kind of um, uh, relative terms. So that uh, give us the perspective and um, uh, also we should uh, evaluate the market uh, very much in line with that. This is also very much uh, echo what you are surveying uh, to release and talk about the important rearrangement, reach adjustment. I think this will take some time, but uh, uh, for some analysts, uh, you know, the, the, the future trajectory, trajectory is already clear. Thanks. And before we go to Walid, I just want to make a couple comments on what Chung has said. Um, certainly the, um, the growth of those consumers and the ability to sell to them via e-commerce. I mean, we've often said over the last couple of years that the e-commerce channels are, are kind of a great democratizer because consumers are choosing to buy your product. You are not needing to um, work with government agencies or on some of the things that are a bit more complicated in other sectors. And we do see within our membership that companies that are dealing in China's e-commerce market have really seen their business grow during COVID-19. And in particular, we have one that helps get companies up and running on e-commerce channels within 30 days. And they've had a rush of re retailers throughout North America and Europe say, my retail stores are closed. I have a lot of inventory. Can I get them up online in China's uh, e-commerce markets, particularly for the upcoming 618 uh, promotion that is going to happen? And so that has already proven itself to be a, a viable channel. Uh, in addition, the McKinsey report that you mentioned, Chung, uh, on ch you know the world depending on China more than China depending on the world, I think definitely plays itself out in uh, the a view of Chinese companies. You know, you remember a few years ago, it was all about going global. Chinese companies had to go out and you saw a big rush of investment overseas. Now that has changed for a variety of reasons, but for many companies, the prize in China is just so big that they haven't needed to expand internationally in order to get the growth that they need. Walid, uh, what, what, what do you want to say about this question? Yeah, so we had a panel at the Rotman School of Management uh, some months ago and Dan Treffler, the leading trade economist in the country and a group from Ottawa, from Global Affairs and other departments, we had a big discussion about trade diversification. Now, as everyone on the phone knows, 75% um, of Canada's exports go to the US and there's a big initiative in Ottawa to diversify Canada's trade. And the one theme that came out is that the two markets that matter most for Canada overall is the United States and China which means that China is a market that Canadians must pay attention to. And even though some companies may be thinking about moving away, those are the big prizes. And as Chung just said, the size of the middle class is just unimaginable. You know, when I teach global strategy, you know, we talk about what the incomes were in China relative to the US in 1980. And it's so low, I don't even want to bring it up, but today, the average income in China is 10,000 US dollars relative to 60,000 in the US. So the average Chinese citizen makes one sixth of what the US makes in US dollars. But as a professor, you have to compare on purchasing power. And on purchasing power, the average income in China is 20,000. So that's mind boggling when you think of the size of the market in China. 
the average Chinese person makes one third of what the average person uh, in the United States makes. It's a huge market. Now, I think what's really, really important, why the survey is important, but also these kinds of conversations, is that we really need to understand the value proposition within China. How do we move into the Chinese market in order to sell there? And while I have a lot to say, the one point I want to stress that's so important, and it's a massive gap in the understanding of executives in Canada generally, the people on the phone is not a representative sample because you're engaged in the Chinese market, but is concern over protection of intellectual property. And as our survey has shown over the last six years is that many companies wouldn't go to China because of a lack of protection for intellectual property. And Sarah could speak to this as well, is that today companies see this as a cost of doing business. China has come a long way. They're not there yet, but they've improved dramatically, which means that many companies can still move into China. And as China moves up the value chain, we have the technology and the brands to be able to do well in China, but it requires further education and further engagement. And that's one of the big differences we see that, um, you know, companies that are active in China are finding that they can very successfully manage their IP strategies through uh, registration, uh, tracking down violators, and then innovating on top of that. And over the course of multiple surveys, we saw IP go from the number one challenge uh, two years later, it went to number four. Two years after that, it went to number 14. And uh, it has consistently now, over the past four years or so, been uh, seen as just another manageable business challenge. So thanks, Waleed, for that. And actually, on the subject of technology, that's one of the things that has become quite sensitive on the U.S.-China side. So I have a question for Chung. Um, there's some legislation in the works that would expand the U.S.'s influence on companies dealing with China in the area of export controls. It came out last week. Uh, I saw yesterday in the China newsletters that it, people had really picked up on it. And as I understand it, the new regulation would require Canadian export to China to seek an export license from the U.S. Department of Commerce if that Canadian product has any U.S. regulated parts, components, or software. And the key is whether or not the end user might uh, be related to the military. So Chung, the U.S. seems to be trying to apply extraterritorial influence on other countries to discourage them from selling to China. How far do you think this go will go? Well, I think that's a real um, uh, uh, important concern. I think even uh, you know White House changed uh, uh, its uh, 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 president. Uh, that kind of concern will continue on the U.S. side because you face a very serious uh, technological uh, competitor, China. Uh, uh, from U.S. perspective, it undermines Americans' advantage or superiority in the technological area. So that kind of anxiety, fear, whether right or wrong will uh, continue in the United States for uh, uh, many years to come. So uh, the export control, some of the things, you know, when it become a law, you cannot uh, easily change. Uh, even the, the president could change. And uh, so that's it's a, a, a long-term challenge. Now, having said that, we should also put into perspective, China is really in a very uh, fast process in terms of um, uh, catching up. You look at the areas that uh, they put a lot of strategic efforts, use their you know, a government power and uh, on the areas like AI, next generation information technology, intelligent uh, high-end manufacturing equipment, new energy uh, vehicles, 3, 3D printing, you know, and the life sciences, and etc. Now, in the case of 5G, and uh, which related with Huawei development, now as my colleague and also the, the uh, at Brookings, he's a uh, non-resident fellow, the, also the author of the uh, New Yorker magazine, he recently observed the U.S. does not have a, a 5G alternative to compete with that of China. Now that's actually is a serious problem on the part of U.S. So he, he said, I quote, a failure that cannot be blamed on spying by China. Now, now also, also noted that the, among the 61 countries that the United States has asked to ban Huawei equipment, only three countries, namely Australia, New Zealand, and Japan, have agreed. Now, that uh, certainly that report came about a few months ago. I do not know the updated information, but uh, uh, the three out of 61 countries, that give you the, the picture. Now, I think in that regard, the United States may uh, have to do some adjustment 
So here I give you the two different, uh, you know, kind of interpretation. On the one hand, short term, even long term, this will remain a big uh, concern on the part of the United States. And uh, some of the policy will continue export control and also um, the, 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 for various national um, uh, uh, security interest concern. Uh, you, as you know, that uh, uh, Donald Trump, this is, uh, you know, before the coronavirus, he actually interferes through his Twitter talk about the issues that any companies to do business with 10% or tend to increase to 25% business with Huawei should be banned, not reduced to 10%. So that eventually, because of Twitter, he changed that uh, move. But now we do not know. He certainly is taking a very anti-China approach at the moment. So I do not see that will be lifted uh, uh, and, uh, in the, uh, or, or change. So again, this will affect many countries, uh, including American allies, such as uh, Canada. I think there will be serious restraints on that uh, end. But the, there's a whole thing so where the help American companies, not to mention about the, the Canadian companies or European companies, that's a debate probably will emerge later on. Well, and this looks to me like an issue on which multilateral uh, collaboration may be necessary. In this case, countries like Canada or the UK uh, coming together and saying to the US, we don't think you should be able to dictate our own export policies. Uh, and we've talked about that sort of multilateral collaboration being something that could work better than one-on-one -on -one arguments uh, on issues, for example, in the phase two US-China agreement, where you get beyond tariffs on products to the soft stuff about forced tech transfer or uh, you know, essentially that free and fair playing field issue. And that's something that at CCBC we have long been saying is, you know, much as you see from the data that Chinese companies doing business in Canada are able to just operate very well, on the other side, it's always been hard to be a foreign company in China. And the US can fight with China all they want, but there are many issues they're fighting about that Europe and Canada and Australia all feel the same way about. Um, so, you know, whether it's teaming up against the US on these uh, export controls or uh, other multilateral collaboration, Walid, um, is, there, is that a strategy that will work? Yeah. And, how, so, and who leads it? Yeah, so I, I'm not sure how much everyone on the call follows the WTO, but Donald Trump, in addition to the unilateralism that you're talking about, Sarah, blocked the appointment of new judges to the, to the appellate body, which essentially means today the WTO is not able to hear a lot of the cases about unfair trade that go before it because the U.S. is trying to undermine the WTO. But you're exactly right. And what's really, really important to stress is that Canada and other middle powers like Canada, whenever we're in the world where the two leading countries are both pursuing policies that are counter to the WTO. China has lots of subsidies and need to open their markets to Canadian and other Western companies. The United States needs to be more multilateral in its approach. Uh, multilateralism is the way forward and Canada is taking the lead with other countries like Australia and Japan and the EU to try to try to come up with alternatives to this uh, unilateralism pushed by the United States. And we need to be successful because in the world where the United States and China are the two powers and they're not pursuing policies consistent with the WTO, that will undermine the economic interests of countries like Canada and others like us. Okay. Now we've got a couple of questions from the audience. And so I wanna, go, I wanna move to those and then we'll go back to our other questions. So. Uh, a question is about industrial supply chains. To what extent can they move out of China? Which industries are most affected, affected and what policy will Canada adopt? So is this an industrial opportunity for Canada? Well, um, you know, I, I, I would love to hear my colleagues. Let me how we start. Uh, certainly, we heard the financial advisor for President uh, Kodoro's uh, remark about a few weeks ago. He even said the uh, U.S. government should pay the moving fees for American companies moving back to Washington, uh, to U United States. I mean, this is uh, uh, it's not the way the uh, uh, multinational company doing business with China. This is not the way that American companies doing business with the world, right? I mean, we're driven by a profit. Uh, if China can provide profit, we, we will uh, uh, you know, take uh, advantage. Uh, if we do not compete, other, other countries will uh, take advantage of that. 
So we do not, I do not see any um, uh, companies, uh, major companies are moving back, except some of the coverage about the Japanese companies and some of them maybe, um, 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 you know, in terms of medical supplies, et cetera. Now, there will be some adjustment of the coronavirus for many countries. I mean, uh, one area is a crucial uh, area that they, use, they should probably, uh, in terms of nation, real national strategic uh, interest, they should be more concerned. You should not be completely dependent on uh, one foreign country. So this is a necessary adjustment. But overall, I think that uh, uh, unless, as I uh, uh, discuss about the real dire situation, which is uh, not on the economic front, but on the security front about the war and the peace. Except that, uh, 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 you know, scenario, I, I do believe that the business companies, uh, Americans, the multinational, will continue their previous practice. I fully agree with my colleague Valis argument that we should, at this stage, we should emphasize multilateralism rather than this, uh, uh, you know, single-minded protectionism. So, I think that uh, my view is there will be some small scale adjustment, but a large scale withdrawal from other foreign countries because of supply chain and industrial uh, chains, and et cetera, it's not happening at the moment. Uh, I don't think it will happen unless we really enter the very serious dire situation about the military conflict. Okay. Waleed, any thoughts from you? Yeah, just a couple of thoughts is, you know, if you think back to after 9-11, Everyone said, I'll never get on an airplane again. And six yeah. months later, the world was back to normal. After the 2008 financial crisis, people said the world will never be the same. And the economy recovered within one or two years. And you know, there's a lot of panic. A lot of it is emotional. We have a book coming out with U of T Press, uh, which talks about um, the importance of protectionism uh, for Canadian productivity and prosperity. I completely reject this idea that Canada should become more protectionist. There are problems, there's no question about it, particularly as it relates to supply chains for critical equipment, medical equipment and PPE, but that's sort of 2% or less of total global trade. Mm. The idea that somehow we're gonna redesign global supply chains as a result of this, I don't see it happening, but what we really need to do is build, and you want to put the word resilience into your vocabulary, the idea that supply chains as they relate to very important medical supplies have to be more resilient. Um, we can get into the discussion as well as to whether Western countries were prepared when it comes to stockpiles and so on, but I do not see any fundamental rethink of global supply chains other than in those really important strategic areas. Well, and if you think about where the, where the consumers are, I mean, a lot of where you put your production depends on who's consuming it and where. And so uh, there are those products for which uh, expanding supply bases to include other regions may be desirable. And, and maybe that comes into the part of this question about, is it an industrial opportunity for Canada? You know, can we encourage companies to be coming here and setting up operations, particularly with our um, uh, USMCA, agreement. Uh, and related to that, another um, attendee has asked, what's your advice on the Canadian government's strategy related to attracting Chinese investment under the current tension between Canada and China? Who will go first? Who you want sure. to I'll, I'll, happily, I'll happily go first. And, you know, this is an area where I've done a lot of research. And, you know, in, in our conversations, uh, the roundtables and also the survey responses, many, many people are asking for clarity on the part of the Canadian government as it relates to a China strategy. I can go through a whole list when Harper uh, didn't allow um, the, the BHP Billiton takeover um, uh, of Potash. That's not really relevant here. What's relevant here, Sinook and Nexon, Harper did allow that deal to go through, but then created new rules which said no further would we allow investments by state-owned enterprises into the energy sector. That's clearly a China-related policy. And then the Liberal government in 2018 didn't allow the takeover of Acon by a Chinese company. Even in the NAFTA, the USMCA, the renegotiated NAFTA, there's a clause that says that if there's a renegotiation, if there's a if there's discussions around free trade between Canada and a non-market economy, again China, we have to get approval. All of these show that there's a lack, and then of course the arrest of the CFO from Huawei. All of these show that there's a lack of clarity 
policy uncertainty creates dramatic effects on business. Now, Sarah, you talked about There's Wendy's book. book yes. And I encourage everyone on this call, including the sea levels everyone to read this book, especially chapter six. I'm going to read one sentence. At present, Canada lacks a, a, a China strategy and so was vulnerable to pressures generated by the U.S.-China relationship that might not best serve Canada's long-term interests. This book has been nominated for the prestigious Donner Prize. I encourage you to get a handle on it, get a hold of it, but chapter six gives a very credible description of what a China policy should look like, and we would be much more successful at attracting investment from China and elsewhere if we took uh, Wendy's advice. Well, uh, let me add that uh, you know, early on in my opening remark, I mentioned about the four factors um, uh, really affect um, Can Can Canadians and also the business community. But uh, these are not equal. I think the two latter factors, namely the deterioration of U.S.-China relations and also the, uh, the, the coronavirus pandemic, are far more important. They actually should change the perspective for the previous two factors, namely that the trade war between China and United States and the tension between uh, Canada and China because of the three, you know, Wanzhou and the two Michaels. So here's my suggestions. One is because of the deterioration of U.S.-China relations, because of the, you know, really devastating impact on coronavirus to the entire world, to China, Canada, and the United States. Um, we, China uh, and Canada probably should look at the issues in a different light. Now, I hope the Chinese government will rethink uh, about the, the, the two Michaels and also um, the Meng Wanzhou case on the part of the uh, Canadian government put in a new perspective and uh, try to make some move to resolve that uh, uh, terrible incident in really hijack the uh, Canada-China uh, uh, relations. So I think this provides opportunity for rethinking on that issue. Secondly, the trade war, uh, you know, certainly um, dominated the, uh, you know, your, your, your survey for a while, but now in light of the recent development, the de deterioration and the coronavirus also profoundly changed. Now, uh, on the other hand, um, you know, first of all, the trade deal is goes nowhere. Uh, uh, I think probably rightly under the current situation, on the part of Donald Trump, he's preoccupied with, uh, you know, when is the, uh, the how to deal with the pandemic. Uh, secondly. Um, uh, is the, about the, the how to recover economy. Now, China's trade deal with China, particularly agricultural products, were not uh, you know, put in that contact with 33 million people unemployed. Uh, that trade deal could not help that much. So it's not a priority at all. Right? For China, they previously wanted to have that deal, at least uh, to uh, make a distinction between so-called deep state. They think that people like the, the Secretary of State, like the, some of the government agencies, they are more hostile to China than President Donald Trump. But with Donald Trump's uh, kind of Chinese virus rhetoric and also blame China, whole thing changed. China is not in the position to uh, accommodate the US pressure. Now this had a profound impact for Canadian business. And the China strategy is very clear. And again, it's a, uh, based on my observation, they want to play EU card, Japan card, and also Canada card uh, to try to lose the business, to avoid isolation or containment on, on the part of the US. So these two areas, in terms of the two Michaels and the Meng Wanzhou case, and in terms of the previous hurdles for China, Canada trade, uh, they provide a lot of opportunities for new thinking to new moves. So this is my suggestion. I think uh, previously, without uh, these, uh, the, two, uh, the, the current problem, the uh, coronavirus pandemic and also deteriorating via China relations, I will not make comment anything positive or a kind of prospects, but now provide the prospects and the new opportunities. Perhaps one very small positive thing coming out of COVID-19, I guess, <laughs> you know, and related to the US um, unemployment numbers that you mentioned, we had one, uh, uh, participant to give us more of a comment than a question, but this is a company that usually 
over time, it has been helping Western companies to hire leaders in their China operations but, uh, and supporting their growth strategies there. But she said in the last year and this year, most of their work is helping large U.S. companies support their employees to find work as they downsize their employee base in China. So there are huge numbers affecting U.S. companies there as well. Now we have another uh, uh, person who says, lost in the COVID-19 and relationship tension are China's moves to further open up its economy. So you have the new foreign investment law and you have the opening of the financial and banking sector in 2020. So are there any comments on that, including potential opportunities for Canadian businesses? Well, uh, China is uh, in a very interesting position on terms of supply chains, it's, uh, it's relatively in good shape uh, compared with some other countries. They do not need to depend on uh, that much on the international um, uh, kind of other, other foreign countries. But on the other hand, as a country lack of resources, it's a country still relying on export to a certain extent. China, for China, economic globalization is a not choice, but a necessity. So China, uh, uh, you know, really wanted to have um, Canadian or many other countries' resources, and China wanted to have the foreign market, particularly huge market, uh, such as uh, EU, Japan, and Canada, and Australia. So in that regard, you do see China will be forced, or will China will take an initiative to promote uh, these kind of exchanges. So you do see some of the positive uh, development uh, in terms of the financial opening, and some of the moves that you cannot imagine just a few years ago. Right, in terms of foreign credit card and many other things. And, but on the other hand, uh, the state um, companies still very much dominate China's market. They are favored by the by, by Chinese government. This is certainly create a hurdle for foreign companies and also for, uh, for China's private sector. So that's a dynamic. We, we will see how that uh, unfold. Uh, so relatively speaking, I'm more optimistic on that, um, you know, uh, 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 the China's own uh, interest to promote, you know, foreign trade, foreign investment, rather than go the other way, uh, as I described. And if I if I may add, I think this underscores the importance of having a clearly defined and articulated China policy on the part of the Canadian government, particularly as a you know a free trade agreement is a lot more difficult than one thinks to sign. But having uh, agreements on uh, market access, sectoral agreements investment protection agreements, but all of those industries you mentioned, Sarah, are exactly the industries that are Canadian strengths. You think about financial services and insurance, you think about infrastructure and transportation, you think about China's Belt and Road Initiative. That's why Canada can't give up. And this idea that somehow we're gonna move out of China, I think is the wrong thing to think about. I really believe we have to reimagine what the relationship between Canada and China should look like. And unfortunately, many people don't see China for what it is. China is really transforming itself and it's done it in record time. In 50 years, it's done what most countries take a, a century to do. Um, and there's lots of potential there for Canadian companies to deepen their ties to do better. But I believe it's absolutely necessary for to accompany that, to enable that is a well-articulated, well-defined Canada strategy as it relates to China. Well, and there are sectors, uh, as you said, not just financial services, um, but uh, we have a member in the healthcare sector yeah. um, that has been able to succeed and is growing rapidly by launching its first uh, wellness center and, and expanding into uh, what's going on to be hundreds of wellness centers in partnership with some of those big Chinese companies, whether it be large insurance companies that need to make sure that their employee that they're that they're insured are healthy, um, and so there are a lot of ways that we can participate. The the clean tech sector and the focus on uh, reduction of impact to our environment is another area in which Canada and China can definitely agree. And so this reimagining of the relationship doesn't mean saying that we like everything China is doing, right? There are plenty of areas to fight for market access or to fight against uh, actions that are happening in China that we might not agree with. But in terms of being a world actor, Canada needs to figure out where there is alignment with China. And we do have business sectors on which that makes sense. So we're getting, um, 
I'll take one more question because this just came through and then we're going to move to the poll results. So the last question is, will China's economy shift from dominance by SOEs to the more efficient private sector, which will be more receptive to multi-sectoralism? Well, to a certain extent, this is already happening. Uh, you see that uh, the private sector uh, actually occupied a lot of uh, you know, a, a large portion of the GDP and um, employment and uh, innovation and uh, uh, new growth and etc. But at the, same, at the same time, the the state of enterprises and the particular gigantic com companies, the flagship companies, are still very very powerful. I do not see um, that uh, China uh, will uh, you know uh, uh, abolish these kind of companies. I think in light of recent development, probably there will be more resources to put that. But the important thing is that, the, that they also should make these companies uh, more market driven, uh, relative speaking, and to uh, reflect the global change. And uh, um, so that's a combination that I don't want to be given the naive or, or wishful thinking that uh, these uh, national uh, champions will be gone. I think it will be with us for a long time. But at the same time, it does not mean that there's no completely no room for private sector for foreign companies. I think this is not the case. So I think that uh, it's, the, it's the, from Chinese perspective, they wanted the best combination. For foreign companies, for uh, private sector, they wanted to make them more competitive and also give some pressures on to how to uh, make the Chinese economy is more market driven rather than the otherwise. So this is my general comment. Okay, and Waleed, you get the last word. Yeah, and I think there's no question that over the coming decade or decades, there's going to be a movement in that direction and it's going to be forced. And the reason I say that is China's growth over the last 50 years was one model of development, providing the world with low cost goods. In the next 10, 20, 30 years, China must transform to an innovation based economy. That's the only way it's going to sustain growth and continued increase in prosperity. Without an innovation based economy, it's going to be a problem. And so, especially with the West, the United States leading the way, trying to prevent China from getting access to Western IP, that means China is going to must develop an ecosystem that allows it to develop its own IP at a much higher level than currently the case. And that's going to require more market reforms. Okay. So thank you very much to both of you. This was a really enlightening discussion and a great, uh, uh, a great add on to the, uh, the nuts and bolts results of the survey. So we should have, if my colleague Ode can share her screen, uh, an update on the COVID-19 answers. Here we go. All right. Okay, so in terms of effect on business, we can see that uh, uh, the answers today, which were a larger number than the gray bars, so the answers are in black. Uh, uh, people expect a minor negative impact at 50% and a major at 42. So, uh, you know, 92% are definitely feeling the uh, impact of that. In terms of time frame to return to normal, in terms of the black bars, we definitely see a shifting out of that time period. You know, we still have 39% that see a return to normal within 2020, but many more in 2021. And then in terms of concerns about uh, COVID and what it's doing to their business, uh, reduced demand has definitely uh, become the number one in, in concern followed by employee travel and customer travel. So, uh, you know, I think there's a lot we have to adjust in our businesses related to COVID-19 and uh, so much of it is not just Canada, China related. Um, but, uh, you know, it does change the equation a bit. And so uh, companies that were rethinking China may continue to rethink China, but others may say, well, if the Canadian or US economies are gonna take longer to come back, maybe I have to better understand China. And uh, uh, if you do want to better understand China, that's one of the reasons CCBC has been here for 40 years, 42 this year actually, and, uh, and will continue to be around for 42 more. So I'd like to thank all of you for attending and uh, thank uh, everyone can give silent applause, I guess, because you're all on mute, uh, to Walid and Chung, who did such a great job of putting these uh, responses into, um, into perspective. 
uh, I see a few raised hands. I think that's, uh, that's indicating that people are, uh, uh, are waving. So thank you to all of you. Uh, great group today. I wish I could have been there with everybody in person, but we will do that again in person soon. So thanks again. Bye-bye.